Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Tim Grierson. I'm a contributing editor to Backstage and a film critic for Screen International and Paste Magazine. Uh, welcome to this screening, uh, Boyhood. Uh, I'm going to stop talking so we can introduce our two stars of Boyhood. Please join me in welcoming Patricia Arquette and Ethan Hawke. nice screening room here. This is where our dudes are going. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us. Congratulations on this remarkable film. Um, just out of curiosity, how many people in the audience, this is their second time or more seeing this film? So a few hands, um, which is a testament, I think, to the greatness of this film. Um, we actually have several questions uh, from the audience, and they're actually exceptional questions and kind of get the ball rolling in terms of things I want to talk to you both about. Uh, in terms of the film. The first question actually goes uh, to both of you, and it's what was the process of preparation like for both of you for this film? Because you're making it one year at a time. Were there rehearsals? Was there an emotional process? Was there any sort of homework involved going year by year with this film? Well, I think both of our processes were kind of different, so I guess we'll speak to those. Um, the whole thing was so different than anything. Rick called me first, he said he had this concept of shooting a movie a week a year for 12 years about watching this little boy grow up and go through first to 12th grade. And I said, oh my God, it's great, man. Are you thinking about me? I'm in. He's like, we don't have any money. I was like, I'm in. <laughs> and then I was like, can I read the script? And he's like, oh, I should probably read the script. He's like, we don't really have one. <laughs> but then he told me like, you're gonna get remarried. You're going, you know, back to school. And a lot of the main architecture and then we spent about three hours talking about mothers, our mothers, me mothering, his experiences of different mothers he'd known, and I got a really strong feeling about it. And then he would call a few weeks, sometimes a few months before the next year's work and say, so the family's moving this year. You're gonna have a scene in the car with the kids. You're gonna have this other scene. I would start thinking about it. He would write a rough draft. I'd fly in, we'd all rehearse as it was, then we would talk about different experiences we'd had or things people had said or their, our friends' experiences. We would then improvise and then he would rewrite the scene like, I love, okay, let's stay with the script and then let's put that little thing you just ad-libbed in there. Let's go back to the script and put that thing in. And for you, Ethan. Yeah, well, one of the things that I think makes Richard such a unique director is he meets everybody where they are. He doesn't ask any actor to be a different actor than they are. You know, I mean, he wants the the way, you know, I've got, I've made eight movies with him, so I've got to watch the way he works with Matthew McConaughey is different than the way he works with you, which is different than the way he works with Julie Delpy, which is different, which is that he really loves acting mm -hmm. and he, um, he wants to meet you where your creativity lives and kind of believes that if you believe what you're talking about and are doing scenes that you want to do that you'll do it better. Um, and so for me it was a very similar experience really but just in the framework of fatherhood um, which is I was a relatively new parent I remember I, I had two kids already when I got hit with this idea same kind of thing we met for coffee and he had this movie he wanted to make, which was not, you know, there was a kind of lie in most movies about childhood, which is that they, they try to make one moment speak for a, for a coming of age. Uh, whereas coming of age, for him, as he talked about it, was more of a series of moments that begin to feel like one. You know, and if we yeah. could capture that. And kids' lives, are, are, they're just, they're, you know, dragged by their parents through their parents' lives. So, what we had to do is just figure out the math of what was happening in the parents' lives. And then the script would reveal itself. Um, and it's a really, it, it sounds really simple when you say it now, but it's just such an uncommon process. And it was so, such an act of faith. I mean, I think a lot of people don't know, like we, we didn't, couldn't sign contracts. Eller and Lorelei didn't have, you can't sign a contract for more than seven years, it's illegal. 
Um, so the whole thing was just, yeah. you know, at any time if Eller didn't want to do it, he didn't have to do it. Um, and, you know, for an investment, that's really stupid, you, you know? I mean, to, to leave it in the whims of a 15-year-old boy who might be breaking out that weekend, you know? Um, but it was, for us, it's an incredible experience. And for Rick and I, both of our fathers, we, maybe it's why we're friends, I don't know, but our fathers are both these very soft-spoken men from Texas who are in the, in the insurance business who, um, I, I remember feeling that, what a unique opportunity Patricia and I were being presented with. Because in a lot of ways, the kids didn't know what they were getting into, right. you, you know? But we were being offered something I don't know if any actors have been offered before, which is to use time as clay to, to make a character. And I realized I could make a portrait. What if I could do a portrait, not just of my, my dad, when I was five or six, my first memories of him, he's such a different man than the man I remembered at my high school graduation, you know? And what if you could do that? What if you could do that portrait? You know, what if you could capture that arc in a movie? It'd be amazing. And so that was the process for, for, for me too. I think a lot of it too was the way Rick directed. Because it could really bite you in the ass to not have a script. Uh, you know, you could really be there like, oh, this is a really bad call and I'm stuck for 12 years because of my integrity. So, all right, here we go. But instead, uh, it was a really beautiful balance of structure and openness. Everyone contributing and then him curating, you know. He had a very specific vision of it all the way along, but there was an openness. You know, many people, if they were making the same movie, would say, we're going to shoot it every July 4th, and that's it. And everything would be structured like that, and it would strangle a lot of things out. And p actors would drop out, and things wouldn't work out. And he uh, he always had a flexibility. You know, even at one point, IFC had closed their books for the year. Oh, we forgot we're making that movie. Oh, that's right. Well, oh, we don't have the money this year. Rick's like, luckily my house just burned down. I got an insurance check, so <laughs> I'll cover it this year. Yeah, we'll work we're cool. It's really true. He, he really has an uncanny um, ability to be open to what is. Uh -huh. As, so many directors feel this responsibility to have this agenda that they have to determine how things are going to go. And that it doesn't let actors have ideas. It doesn't mm -hmm. let cinematographers have ideas. He's incredibly confident. I mean, it's a strange irony that it both seemed like we were making up the movie as we went along. And the finished movie is exactly what he described to me over coffee. And it, it's a, I remember, it's hard to explain, but there was no script, but he had such clear ideas. I remember I would have, well, what's happening this year, Rick? Well, we got to do a baseball game, right? I mean, right? Got to have a baseball game in there somewhere. You know, it's a dad. Shit, I don't remember anything but going to baseball games with my dad. Okay, cool. So we're going to baseball game. I got an idea. Well, what if when, you know, I, I'd do this riff about, well, when I was going to baseball game, it was all about the hot dogs and we were going to catch up and I told him this really funny story. Yeah, no, no, no. There's no concession scene. Um, oh, okay. Well, what about this? And, and, and it was, it's very specific. And like, I'd have this idea about a speech. He's like, oh, okay, that'll go in the car ride then. Oh, what, what's the car ride? Yeah, there's about a two minute long car ride scene. <laughs> oh, but it was, it was like mapped out like that. And it, it was like... Um, and he was like, and that's like four years from now. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like he, he knew the, uh, the music, just not the lyrics, uh -huh. you know? Yeah. And, and that he knew like, okay, yeah, and then, this will, and then something exciting is going to happen over here. But it also, I think what made it possible is we all had the same feeling about work and how work should be. And I felt from the beginning like, wow, I have this honor to play mothers that struggle, and imperfect mothers, and m mothers you know, that we don't really celebrate or get to see very much on film. If I just stay with the truth of that, it's not like, OK, yeah, this year, let's do this thing that I want to do for me as an acting thing. It wasn't so hard to get back to if you reminded yourself it was really about the truth and normalcy and human beings and just uh, you know normal middle class family it's it's true of um, the before trilogy as well but there's a spell that Rick casts which is a kind of non-drama mm -hmm. it, it it's 
it's, it's strange, it, 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 the scenes have energy and flow, but they don't have a narrative arc the way we're taught to write and work on a scene, which as an actor is really challenging because you have nothing, there's no plot to lean back against, mm -hmm. you know? There's no plot creating energy. But you have, you have to do exactly what Patricia is saying and did, which, because if, if you stop telling the truth for a second, what's revealed is that there's no plot. It, it all of a sudden, it's like the spell breaks. As soon as you force a joke, or is, as soon as you see an actor trying to squeeze out a tear, or do something, or looking like they're in their light, you, know, you have to be just totally, you, you, you have to be totally, you just give over to that normalcy. And then this, there's this undercurrent, the subconscious starts to work, and there's this other hidden drama that is what he's really hunting after, you know? Um, and in terms of working with, with Eller, I mean, he had done, I think, one play, one commercial or something before starting this. Well, he movie. was six. I mean, yeah. he, I wouldn't be too critical of his <laughs> bio. I think. He'd only done yeah. one commercial. I'm just saying, when I was six, I was much more accomplished. Than yeah, him. No, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure he's a good person. Well, most of us were, yeah. But in terms of the great risks of this project, you know, as you said before, you have a kid who could decide at any point. I don't want to. I don't want to do this anymore. He could have been a jerk or yeah. untalented, you know. I mean, Rick did structure a lot of that early architecture. He also left space to see who the kids became, because mm -hmm. if Eller turned into some big jock football player, the movie would have gone in some way into a different direction. So again, it was that structure and that openness. But he also talks about casting Eller. It was like nine auditions, and they weren't really about reading or scenes. Mm -hmm. They were about talking, like, well, what are you into? What kind of music do you like? And Eller was not anything like Mason. He was liking Nine Inch Nails, saggy pants, you know. But he would draw drawings and talk about his art and what his favorite movies were. And he, Rick was like, you know, he wasn't polished. He wasn't trying to please you. He wasn't smiling. You know, the actor kid's like, ding, aren't I charming? He was like, this is how I think. This is how I see the world. And I'm not trying to please you, really. And Rick said he saw in him the sensitive, artistic boy and thought, I think that's interesting to watch. And I think that he's kind of the, the magic of the movie, that it, it very easily, as I, over the years, try to describe to people what this would be, it, nobody really kind of knew what I was talking about. <laughs> but if they started to think, well, isn't that going to be kind of like a gimmick? You know, that be kind of gimmicky? I was like, well, maybe. No, I mean, that is, I guess, where, but there's something about Eller that elevated the whole project because you just watch him develop as a young man and it, it turns it into something deeply personal and some real self-expression is at work through, through him. I think that without him, it would have been a stun. I, the, they both are incredible people and incredibly talented, but mm. he, at a certain point, talks about how the movie really became a really incredible outlet for him as he became a teenager. And for us, it was an incredible gift. I mean, yeah, you're, you're kind of teaching kids how to act and also learning from kids how to act at the same time. But there were, you know, I'd be crying in the scene in the, in the garage and they'd sit next to me while I'm getting ready and I'm kind of getting quiet and trying to get myself in that space. They're like, what are you thinking right now? <laughs> How do you make yourself cry? Okay, sit right here. <laughs> I'm like, okay, part of me wants to go like, let's just let me do this for a second. The other part of me, I feel a responsibility, like they're smart, they're inquisitive, they want to know. And the whole time they wanted to know, like, okay, here's what I'm thinking. Wait, hold on. Okay, so now here's what I'm doing. <laughs> uh, so it was just, I don't know, it was a really interesting experience and then at a certain point, they just came to the table with their stuff and they were just like, yeah, I think my character would say this in the scene and my friend said this really weird thing and they really started to bring it, you know, and it meant a lot to them. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is that you as actors have almost different relationships with him because there are a lot of scenes with Olivia, there are a lot of scenes with Mason Sr., but not a lot of scenes with the two of you together. In terms of working with Eller, I'm curious about how, what the rapport was like. Was it easy from the beginning? Was he, was he nervous at the beginning of this process? Or was he, did he not really sort of understand the process of this is going to be a 12-year thing? And when you're young, you have no way of knowing that. But you did an amazing, you, 
you warmed them both up, didn't you? You took them out that first year, and, and well, Rick had me, yeah, come into town, and he said, "Okay, this lady's gonna play your mom," and then I had them for the weekend. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> Rick's like, "You could stay in my house with the kids," and so we made back any cheese, and we played in the backyard, and you know, did a lot of art projects, um, and kind of bonded like that. But one of the weird things, which wasn't part of your question, but a real epiphany I had watching the movie was because we never had a full script. I knew that Ethan's character would take the kids camping, but I didn't know what was said when they were camping exactly or what it felt like, who he was as a father. All my character knew was she resented him, that he bailed, that he didn't give her enough money, that he didn't take the kids as much, and you know, all these resentments. So when I was watching the movie the first time, my character was also watching the movie the first time. Mm -hmm. And I got to see like, wow, yes, there's validity to all those arguments, but he's also an incredible dad and all the great things he gave to the kid. And I just wish that we each had that opportunity to see a bigger picture of someone we resent. And if you have a great kid with someone, whether you get along with them or not, chances are good that a lot of that's also coming from the other parent. Because I think like, that's so true about divorced parents that they don't know the other side, but also I'm curious for the two of you, because it really isn't a scene until, there are a few scenes throughout, but really at the end mm -hmm. is the real scene between the two of you. Did you work together with Linklater at the same time each year? Was it spread out? Did you two talk much about the characters and these it's children? It's pretty separate. We're we pretty had, we, separate. Sometimes there'd be a crossover, yeah, and Ethan will give us some great ideas about something we'd be doing, but it was kind of a mystery. It was kind of, but I would get these calls. I remember, because often Rick was working on other projects, you know, and so you, you get a call at like 11.30, or I, I would, and it, it's like right before he's going to bed, and I'd be walking my dog or something, and he'd be like, hey, talk to Patricia. Yeah, she says this, that, and the other thing, you know? You think that's true? Yeah. Well, I don't know, yeah. I mean, what, what, what does she mean? Well, she thinks blah, 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 blah. All right, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, cool, talk to you later. <laughs> and and, and this is, he does a lot of that cross-pollinating, you know, talking to this person, talking. He's the center spoke, you, you, you know, and where, where all things, you know, connect through that way. But I think it was, I felt very involved with you, but we didn't, you know, our, that last scene you're talking about, that's what I want to say, that, that wasn't, we weren't originally going to do that. That was going to, part of the whole I, concept is you were never going to get that scene. You're never going to get to see mom and dad together. And then we were shooting that whole scene, and it, it felt like we were skirting something, that, it, that, that the, the movie was calling for us mm -hmm. to. Yeah. And, and we whipped that. I mean, it was amazing. It almost it took 10 years to write, and it took five minutes to write that scene. Mm -hmm. you, you, you know? Yeah. If we, I often think about this. If I'd been asked to play those last scenes, you know, this is what normally you have to do as an actor, right? I would have to have played those last scenes the same, around the same time I shot the first scenes, 12 years earlier, I, I think I would have imagined, I don't know how I would have played them, but I think I would have done like a fat suit and dyed my hair gray and had a, had a cane or something. You know? Well, son, you know, I don't know the point of life. You know, I mean, it's like, and, and instead, getting to actually live through those moments and, and you would have these little, Epiphanies, and they felt like epiphanies. Like, no, you know what? I need to thank her. I really think I need to. I think he's. We can make the little glib comments, and we can tease and do this, but there needs to be. And it just seems so right at the dishwasher and everything. Yeah, and he was like, I want to offer you some money, and then and we were going through all that, and then he's like, and I, Oh, but then maybe she has the money. Yeah. <laughs> the, the new wife has yeah. the money, and it's like, oh, of course. Okay. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks for the offer. All right, well, but the whole time I really wanted, like we wanted to have a scene together. We were always saying to Rick, like, can't we, we need another scene together, we need another scene together. Which is kind of great, because I think when people have unfinished business, yeah. they have a million other scenes they're supposed to have together. There's something in them that always wants to have all these other scenes, all the I mean, things that two, never got said. Two or three of the scenes that we have together are like me picking up the kids and us not saying anything to each other. Right. Or mm -hmm. I'm sitting there talking to your new boyfriend or mm -hmm. I'm to, you know, and, and we're just not talking to each other, which was so frustrating. Yeah. But I mean, it was good too. 
Yeah, so much, there's so much is said when you can't talk to somebody. Yeah. This is actually one of the other questions that segues perfectly in what we're talking about. In terms of coming back every year to this, in terms of establishing sort of an emotional through line for yourself, because it's not like you're not doing other roles at the same time, was there sort of a discipline that you had to get into about returning to a character over and over again year after year? I think I sort of was talking about that when I said you have to go back to the truth. And I to go back to that first conversation that I had with Rick and to all the mothers I knew in my life and that sort of archetype. But also it, a lot of this movie was being of service, being present to the group experience and to what other people were contributing, talking to the kids about what their life had been like that year. And there was so much truth in that whole process that it just brought you back to the truth all the time. Did you ever go back, did Linklater show you footage from the years before? Or how did that work as you were going through this process of making the movie? It worked different for all of us. For me, um, he offered all the time, but I did see a rough cut of the first five years. And then I said, I don't want to see it anymore because I, I want to see it with the, I want to be like an audience member. I really want to see this movie like as best I can remove myself and see this movie in the whole thing. He didn't offer to show it to the kids at all. He didn't want them to become self-conscious and they never asked to see it either, luckily, so that wasn't a problem. And they said, you know, of course, it was difficult to see the movie because the transitions they go through at certain ages, you have awkwardness and those ages are hard to live through, let alone be reminded with <laughs> thousands of people. And for you, Ethan, did you watch well, any for, of it? For me, it was a little different because, you know, I, I wrote and acted with Rick and before sunset and before midnight, both while we were making this. Right. So I was around the guy all the time. Um, and so I, I watched it get put together. And the hard thing for me was uh, I just, I slowly started realizing how good it was and how much I wanted to be in it more, you know? <laughs> you know? So, I think it'd be good maybe Thanksgiving in Mason Senior's house, you know? <laughs> you know? You'd be and, like, no. Yeah, Rick be like, no, don't see that. And um, that for me was, uh, the, the truth is, at first it felt extremely experimental. It felt like this radical, weird thing we were working on. And slowly it gained this power, and I think that we all felt of wanting, wanting to be a, a part of it more and not wanting it to end. Uh, Patricia and I both had the same feeling at Sundance. Um, I've never had this feeling. I, I, you know you often hear um, some painter works on a painting or something, and, and then they don't want to sell it. They don't want to show it. Like, I always never understood that. I really just, I didn't get it. I was like, what did you do it for? And I don't, and I didn't want to show the movie. Mm -hmm. I, I, I loved it so much. I felt I nervous for the kids. It had been a secret and it had been such a special place to do the kind of work I most wanted to do. I mean, we were given a chance to do work about real people and, and to really, what's more important to us than our families? You know, and yet, usually when you see a family drama, it's set because the Russians are attacking at dawn, or you know, there's some other thing, and it's kind of about family, but it's really about Russians at dawn, and 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 and, and, and this is really about family. And I just, I was scared to show it. I didn't want to. I didn't really see the point. Um, and uh, it was such a wonderful thing, and so it was. I already am starting to miss the experience of making it, yeah. you know? Also, it was a really strange experience because it was a movie basically that was never coming out. You'd go and make it, and you'd be like, yeah, I made this movie. And I was working on a TV show for a lot of it, and people would be like, you used to make these great art movies. And I was like, I'm still making one. <laughs> and I, no, yeah, no, but you, <laughs> I was like, I really am making one, a really good one. But um, at the time, it was like we were making it, and it never came out. So it really only became about the process. There was no studios around, no, no PR. There was no reporters. Such an intellectual no, idea nothing. that it would even come out. I remember doing one of the scenes. One of my, I came home. It's, it's the weekend, the baseball weekend. It's the one with um, the um, no elves scene, right? Uh -huh. And I remember flying home and, and telling a friend that I think that was the best like 
There's a couple of things in there. I was like, I think this is the best scene work I've ever done in my life. I said, oh, cool. When do I see it? I was like, well, eight or nine years. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like, it was such a weird thing. Like, would the world exist? You know? <laughs> Well, I think it's interesting because this idea that, like you said, you, you and the rest of the cast and the crew, you, you had this secret, this thing that you were working on. And I'm curious for you, when it got closer to the end, if there was a sense of that this will end at some point. You were mentioning about being on Medium. You know, when, when shows are around for a long time and when they end, cast and crews get very emotional about the fact this is the last scene, last shot. Was that very hard to walk away from this? I think Ethan said that this was finished, obviously, shooting last year. How hard was it to finally say, okay, we are now officially done with this 12-year project? I really can't stand it. I still really cannot stand it. I, uh, it's so beautiful, the response this movie's had, because it's really been met with the same kind of love. I think you and Eller, or Rick and Eller said that, that we made it with love, and it really has been respond met with that same love and the same feeling of love we made it with, but I would rather just keep it to myself still. <laughs> I mean, I, if I had to trade off the way people feel about it or my personal selfish experience of making it, I almost would. It was yeah. that incredible to make it, so I'm really sad it's over, but also so grateful that this little movie that Rick wrote and directed in a really unorthodox way has had this reception. It was amazing when, because um, I finished first, and I remember saying goodbye to you in Austin, and you, you had some more work to do. And, um, and then when you finished, then Eller had the scene at college, you know, going, he had the last scene in the movie. And I remember getting texted, I, I, was it Eller or Rick texting the photo, or somebody else in the crew texted me a photo of, of Rick and Eller hugging out in the desert, mm -hmm. you know, and it was like somebody broke a glass or something, you know, I felt my whole body just mm -hmm. kind of vibrate with like realizing something seeing in their body, you know, you can just see in somebody's body language when something powerful is happening. And the way that they were hugging each other, because they're both not super huggers. They're yeah, not they're, not, they're both like, <laughs> not like that. And um, I was really moved and I knew like, oh, something's happening this is a, some, yeah. you know now that you know because a, a normal ordinary film project you know you maybe go and do We're promotion. Spend 12 years promoting it. yes yeah. <laughs> i think that's only fair at this point yeah. but, you know with, a, with a, a usual film project you know you, you go and promote it for a few weeks people tell you their own impressions and interpretations of the film i'm curious about this movie because not only did you shoot it for 12 years you, know, you sort of live with it for 12 years and you've been talking about it and promoting it since sundance I'm curious, in terms of what you've heard back from people, from interviewers like myself, or journalists, or just audiences, what have you learned about the movie that you didn't necessarily put into it or feel yourself, but other people are interpreting by what they see up there? A guy walked up to me the other day, he barely said hi to me, or he just said, what were all the little whales about? I said, what do you mean? He's like, I just saw Boyhood. There was four different whales. There was a moving van whale, a little whale on the wall. I said, I, I don't know. I don't remember <laughs> the little whales. Well, you taught me something, sir. Thank you very much. So, I mean, some are a little more esoteric than others. I, I know what the whales mean, but I can't say. Um. This question uh, is specifically for Ethan um, from the audience. What is the most challenging role that you have played and why? I don't know. I mean, I, things are challenging. I love it when things are challenging. I mean, the most challenging thing is to work on a bad script with a shitty part. <laughs> and I mean, that's the most challenging thing to do. I love it, like, you know, so I was like, Daniel Day-Lewis talks about the challenges of doing Lincoln, you know, and I kind of roll my eyes a little bit because I'm like, I'm like, oh, it's such a challenge to play one of the greatest characters in the history of the world with one of the greatest directors and the greatest writer and the greatest DP. Shit, I'll take that challenge, you know? Uh, it's a challenge to be on a set with a bunch of numb nuts and a bad script, you know? That's challenging. Um, for, yeah, we might want to stop him and keep going. Um, for
for Patricia, working on medium and working on a television show, I've, I've asked this of, of Linklater, and I'm curious of your opinion. You know, in some ways, boyhood almost feels like the way that television works, where you're shooting something, going away, and then going back and shooting something. I'm curious, medium obviously was a much more intensive process, um, but is there any comparison to be made at all between doing a film for 12 years, a little bit of a time? Um, is there any? Well, I think also television really depends, you know, television is much more a showrunner's medium than really a director's medium. And so I think it depends on your showrunner, kind of the way that it feels. But I feel like there was a lot more freedom, maybe because there was less corporate oversight. But this movie, most people, I think if a studio had been much more involved or the amount of money, you know, that they were putting in was higher, they might not be okay with, like, what is this scene? No, no, we need the kid to get beat up in the street. We need, you know, a drug addiction, you know, thing. It, it, you know, television has a certain structure that's pretty, you know, you can count on it. And I think people do count on it when they go to watch it. They want to see that little thing all get wrapped up before they go to bed. Now that you have both finished this project, I'm curious for future projects, after signing up for something for 12 years, does anything seem too difficult or too strange in terms of something that you would sign up for now? Weird thing is this movie was never difficult. It was never difficult to say yes. It was never difficult to show up. It was, the only thing that's difficult is that we're not doing it anymore. So I think, you know, as an actor, you have to go from your gut about everything, you know? So I think you just feel your way through it. And sometimes something in you says no, and you've got to ask yourself, is that my fear that's saying no? Or is that really, this isn't right, you know? It's interesting because I, I love hearing you say that because I can say that you, sometimes Patricia would be working so hard. Uh, you know, I've never, I think, aside from maybe a couple times, it, um, like doing uh, the Scottish play or something, well, if I ever worked as hard as you were working on Medium, and you would have like four days off, and she would fly in, we would rehearse in the Omni Hotel. Rehearsal started at 11.30 p.m., you know, because that's when we all, all, and we would work all night and then do wardrobes in the morning and do this thing. And you threw yourself at this, um, I think because you honestly love telling the truth and the opportunity to play a woman like this and the opportunity to play a real full-blooded woman, you know? Um, but it's so wonderful to hear you say that it wasn't work because to a lot of people, they would think that it really was a lot of work, you know? Um, it was, uh, anyway, I love working with Patricia. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Patricia and Ethan, thank you very, very much. For thank, you. thank you, guys thank you guys for coming and staying. Thank you for your questions.